the presentation. Yeah, so hello everyone. And uh, thank you, Nana, very much. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to be part of this uh, wonderful group. And uh, you gave us enough of an introduction that I don't have to go too much into that. I will just briefly tell you how we will organize um, the presentation part of today. So we will start with Richard and he will give you a general outline uh, of the main findings related to all the countries that were surveyed in this project. Uh, then uh, Tim will present uh, the Swedish and German results. Una will give us an insight into Latvia. I will briefly present the Serbian results and then we will circle back uh, to the general picture of all of Europe. And then hopefully we'll have a very inspiring discussion after that, which will probably take about 15 minutes. We will each take around five to 10 minutes. And then after that, we hope to have ample time for discussion. Uh, while we speak, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A section. Uh, and then if we have enough inspiring questions, we can, after we all finish our presentations, already take a round and each of us can discuss the most interesting ones. Uh, but then after that, or instead of that, uh, if there aren't uh, questions already in the Q&A, we will ask you to raise your hands and then we will promote you to panelists. And you can, if you wish, turn on your cameras, but certainly turn on your microphones and we can discuss things uh, a bit more interactively because for now, this is the webinar format. Uh, so most of the results that we'll be presenting today, uh, they come from the reports that have already been published. Uh, you have the links in the chat, Alessandra posted them. Uh, if you're watching this uh, online, you have it on the page where you are now probably or on the CHURN website. So please, yes, read uh, both the report or the reports that were published uh, within the Cinephone project and then also the policy brief that the four of us authored for CHURN. And uh, without further ado, I would like to now give the floor to Richard. Thank you very much. Let me share the, my screen. So I hope you should be uh, you should be seeing my screen now. Is that correct? Okay. So uh, everything important from the organization perspective was already said. So let me just thank uh, Nana, Alexandra, and Yelena, and everyone who organized this. Um, and uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, this is um, this presentation is part of a much broader academic research. Um, but um, our goal is to present some uh, findings which might be relevant also for non-academic audience, so policymakers, uh, media, maybe uh, professionals, and so on and so on. Um, without further ado, let me uh, begin. So um, maybe Sorry, some Richard, of you... Uh, we just see the, the web page. We don't see the presentation. So let me try one, once again. Yeah, you probably shared the wrong window. Sorry. That's better. Yeah, and just yeah. the full screen. Well. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, I guess the key question we should start with is uh, why view of China matters, or if it, is, if it actually matters. Um, there is a longer theoretical discussion, but uh, also our findings show that there is significant and strong correlation between how um, respondents view China and some key um, foreign policy questions. So for instance, uh, respondents who have more positive view of China are more likely to uh, support cooperation with Chinese companies on 5G. Uh, they are not interested in preventing China's geopolitical expansion. They are not so interested in advancing human rights and democratic reform in China. They are more interested in economic diplomacy and they are more interested in foreign policy alignment with China. These are the things which we've tested in the questionnaire. We didn't ask um, about the uh, CHI, the investment agreement, but um, um, I think that we could hypothesize that also um, respondents who would have more positive view of China would be more likely to oppose uh, signing of this of this agreement, uh, because if you follow the general discussion, uh, basically the discussion about the investment agreement very often now develops into whether the EU wants to sign an agreement with China, which um, commits uh, human rights uh, violations, which acts uh, assertively in foreign policy, and so on and so on. So I think uh, studying public opinion uh, matters, or the view of China matters. Um, now, uh, the bigger question is whether uh, public actually have any influence on foreign policy. 
um, how strong this relationship would be, whether foreign policy follows public opinion or whether public opinion would, fo would follow foreign policy. Uh, we don't really um, going to answer that question here or with this research for now, but um, in democracies, at least, uh, we uh, assume that government would conduct policies which are in line with public opinion. Um, there is a question mark how that works in authoritarian regimes, but there is research support suggesting it would be similar or even stronger. Nonetheless, the starting point for our research is that in democracies, public opinion can play a significant role in foreign policy, at least under certain circumstances. And basically we claim in this presentation and also in the policy brief, which we've published that right now in Europe, China is perceived as such an issue. So uh, it is crucial for European uh, policy towards China to take into account uh, public opinion because this would present some uh, limitations. Uh, there is a lot of uh, literature uh, and theory discussing that. I'm not going to go through that. If anyone, if anyone wants to raise any questions about what we can, we can do that. But essentially the literature discusses um, what are the driving forces of uh, views of China. For instance, quite recently, Pew Research Center suggested that political ideology doesn't play any role when it comes to views of China, except for the, for the US. Um, the ECFR, for instance, showed that in UK, conservatives are more likely to blame China for COVID-19. Uh, there are other research showing how, for instance, the leavers and remainers in UK would differ. Much of this research has been done in the US or perhaps in uh, UK or Western European countries. So um, our, um, our survey, uh, as far as I know, should be one of the uh, more most comprehensive and detailed when it comes to public opinion uh, around Europe uh, of China and on various uh, aspects of China. So this, this is one of the key tables and key charts which, uh, which we found. And you can see, for instance, that Sweden is the most negative when it comes to China, while Russia and Serbia are the most uh, positive. Um, but really, the, the most of the EU countries do not differ so, so much. For most of them, we can say that uh, the view of China is rather negative. And um, over here, we can see uh, how the view of China changed in recent years. So we only did the survey once, but we asked respondents whether their view of China over the past three years improved, worsened, or stay the same. And as you can see, again, um, in most European countries, uh, respondents say their view of China got much worse in, in recent years. Serbia is a very important outlier here. So these first two charts already emphasize one of the points we are making. Europe is often presented as a divided. Uh, in particular, when it comes to China, very often we can hear discussions about Europe being divided on China and so on. But really, um, at least the EU countries actually have surprisingly a lot of sim similarities when it comes to uh, the view of China already from these few uh, first charts, but let's look uh, at some more uh, details. So uh, over here, for instance, uh, looking at how respondents uh, trust China, EU, US and Russia, again, we can see that in all the EU countries, the trust of the EU is uh, significantly higher than trust of the US, which is mostly on the second spot. Um, and then Russia and China would have very little trust around the EU, EU members. Uh, it, like just to, to acknowledge how close EU members are to each other, uh, you can look at the view in Serbia and Russia, uh, which are really very different, right? Uh, in both of them, uh, they trust more China, in Serbian case also they trust uh, the most Russia, and only then come the EU and the US. Similar picture would be also visible here in terms of foreign policy alignment. Uh, all the EU countries want to align with the EU first uh, and with the US second. Um, but there are some uh, exceptions for Latvia and so on. But uh, again, we don't really see any significantly big differences. Um, 
So of course the question is, what is driving the view of China? We ask the respondents an open question to tell us what is the first association of China. We collected data in October and uh, September 2020. And over here you see Spain, over here Italy. Uh, you can see COVID-19 has been far the second, uh, by far the most uh, immediate association of, uh, of China. Um, some other topics emerge as large population or communism or technology. Uh, the similar picture would be in France, as you can see over here. Uh, I'm showing here the Czech picture because Czech Republic is a, a bit of an outlier here. Uh, and the most common association in the Czech Republic of China for most respondents is communism, followed by most populous country, COVID comes uh, afterwards. Um, so to sum up this one, uh, as I said, COVID-19 in 2020 is really the first association for most Europeans and in particular in these countries. In Sweden, in the Czech Republic, uh, themes of dictatorship or communism prevail. Um, there are prominent associations of, uh, of culture, uh, especially in Central Europe, in the Visegrad four countries. Um, just to show, to go a bit deeper into what are the European preferences, and now I'm talking about the EU, the 10 EU countries from among the 13 countries we sur surveyed. Um, so the most, we, we asked here how respondents, how positively or negatively respondents perceived various issues related to China. And Chinese technology and trade, trade with China are the two issues which are actually perceived a bit on the positive side, where 50 should be neutral. Uh, you can see that all the others are somehow uh, leaning towards the negative. Uh, and at least this was quite surprising or interesting to me, that China's impact on the global environment came as the most negatively perceived, even ahead of military power, effect on democracy. Um, but for instance, Chinese investments were also kind of perceived uh, not very positively. Mm. Then we asked what policies Europeans um, supported in terms of China. And uh, again, this is the table showing uh, the, all the surveyed countries. And Europeans want to cooperate with China on global issues. Now, this is important to emphasize um, that kind of the picture we are getting here is European respondents don't trust China, but they see it probably necessary to cooperate with China when it comes to issues such as climate change, epidemics, counterterrorism, and so on and so on. Now, of course, we were doing this survey during the COVID-19, so probably that also played a bit of a role. Nonetheless, this was uh, quite consistent, uh, one of the most supported policies all around Europe. Um, now, addressing cybersecurity shows us uh, what I just said, that Europeans, you know, sometimes Europe is presented as being naive, that, um, you know, Europe wants to cooperate with China, but uh, addressing cybersecurity in terms of, uh, in relation to China shows that Europeans do recognize security implications, but they don't want to engage in geopolitical competition. They don't want to kind of try to prevent Chinese geopolitical expansion. Um, so I think this table overall um, and the previous one might give us also some guidance if we wanted to compare European attitudes uh, towards China with, for instance, the US attitudes towards China. Um, I'm not going to get into this table, but basically this table shows the, sim the same thing as the previous one, just at the level of different countries. And there are really similarities. For instance, Sweden is the only one where uh, advancing human rights is slightly first foreign policy uh, priority together with cooperation on global issues. But you see that also cybersecurity is the third. Now you see that, for instance, in most of Western Europe, cybersecurity uh, is first and then cooperation on global affairs, uh, on global issues, second or third. Um, okay, so far I was uh, saying that European countries or Europeans have rather similar view of China. Um, let's now find out what is driving these views, because as we, as we uh, saw, uh, the view of China is important indicator for uh, many respondents uh, preference, even in terms of uh, issues such as uh, 
cooperation on 5G and so on and so on. So let me show you uh, some findings. Um, for instance, um, we saw that, uh, that older people around Europe have more negative view on, on China. This is poly, uh, statistically significant. It has three stars that, that uh, symbolizes statistic significance. Uh, we saw that uh, people with the tertiary education, so university educated people, have more negative view of China. Um, then we see, for instance, that um, the, the right wing uh, right-wing respondents, so those who, uh, who self-identify as right-wingers, have, again, more, more negative view of China. Uh, what is interesting is over here, um, there is very strong correlation between view of China and the view of Russia, uh, but interestingly, also view of Hong Kong. So for most respondents, uh, they don't really see China and Hong Kong as kind of uh, differently, or there are, of course, differences, but there is a very strong positive correlation between the two. And interestingly, even, for instance, with, uh, with the view of uh, India or Vietnam we have, and, the, and Japan, right? So even though, for instance, Japan and China, right, they would have very different political regime, they would be political competitors or rivals in East Asia, but still their views uh, is positively correlated. Now, um, one of the last things I want to finish up with is that um, even though various European countries in the West, in the East, in the North, in the South, overall have on average similar views of China, they have similar kind of policy preferences maybe, but the driving forces sometimes are different. And I think that's very interesting. And over here, for instance, uh, we see that liberals in Western Europe are more positive about China. Uh, while the liberals in Central and Eastern Europe are more negative about China. Mm. Another, another interesting difference is that respondents who are more nationalistic in Western Europe are more negative of China. But in Central and Eastern Europe, these respondents would be more positive. And the, the other exactly vice versa, it's for the uh, European identity. So the respondents in the Western Europe who, are, who feel more European also feel, feel slightly more positive about China, while in the Central Eastern Europe, they are more, uh, more negative. Um, let me show you this table to explain why that is the case. So on this slide, you can see the situation of in the Czech Republic and in France. So over here, we see um, the respondents who voted for the current Czech president uh, have far more positive view of China while the respondents who didn't vote for him are far more negative. Like, this difference is really huge, especially if you compare it, for instance, in France, right? I mean, M Macron and Le Pen would be probably considered as very different politicians. Nonetheless, voters, their voters don't really differ in terms of their view of, of China. Um, so this is, for instance, th th this I find interesting. And I think this explains, Czech Republic is a bit of an outlier, but uh, the thing we observe here is similar in other Central Eastern European countries that the respondent, respondents who are more liberal, more pro-European, see China a bit as a threat of um, maybe democracy and, uh, the, and United Europe and so on. We don't really see such a, uh, such a worry being present in the West. And I think I'm going to finish here. I have just a few more slides here. So uh, this basically shows what I just said, that in the Czech Republic, for instance, respondents who are more positive, more positive about Europe are more negative about, uh, about China. While, for instance, in UK is, the, is, is opposite. In most Western European countries is opposite. So respondents who are more positive about Europe are also more positive about, about China. Um, this is about the age, for instance, as I said. Uh, again, you can see there is a bit of a difference between the Czech Republic, where younger where the older respondents tend to be more positive, uh, while in UK is exactly the other way around. So I have a few more uh, slides, but I will, I'm going to finish here and pass the floor to Tim, and we can, of course, get into more details later on. Thanks so much, Richard. I hope uh, everyone can hear me well. Um, 
And I will, excellent. Um, yeah, as uh, Yelena said already in the beginning, I'll briefly introduce uh, you to you the findings from two countries, uh, Germany, I am a German national myself, and Sweden, I work and live in Sweden. So I hope that in case you have questions on these particular countries, I may also uh, respond to that. Um, in general, of course, we find uh, uh, that uh, respondents are mainly in line with what Richard has already uh, outlined. So I think it can be brief, but that it might be nice to zoom into two countries here. Uh, if we look sort of at Germany, uh, maybe as uh, setting a bit the scene here, I think what has sort of uh, shaped very much the German debate about uh, uh, China has, of course, been those issues that uh, all of us sort of concern uh, in the last few years, be it COVID this year, be it uh, the Huawei debate, uh, be it Hong Kong to some extent. Um, so, so that is, of course, uh, the case here um, uh, for for everyone. Um, but it's 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 particular, I think, being discussed in Germany. Uh, for two reasons. First is sort of uh, that we see that Angela Merkel is uh, in her final months of her uh, chancellorship. And, and then, of course, there's plenty of debate in Germany already how the country is going to shift afterwards. And I think we will see a significant shift. It is also always related in a country like Germany that is uh, perceived as being one of the leading countries in Europe, uh, how sort of Germany relates to the EU. And then I think there's one specific story in, in Germany as well, and that relates to technology and the acquisition of a robotics company, KUKA, a couple of years, where a lot has been, uh, has been shifted. First, of course, in elites, but then sort of also triggering down more and more to uh, the media and potentially also to public opinion. So what are sort of the findings in this uh, general setting in Germany? You, we see, um, uh, if you look at the, at the bottom right, you see the general perception. It is more than 60% uh, having uh, uh, an overwhelmingly negative, very negative or negative perception of China. So, so it's in, in line with what Richard has pointed out. You can also see on the right top corner, uh, uh, in this graph that uh, for 46.7%, it has uh, worsened, the, the image of China has worsened, 40% stable, only 13%, only for 13% it has improved. And also, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you can uh, easily identify uh, I mean, it's not super surprising that Germany is the most positively viewed country uh, among Germans, but uh, look at uh, China being uh, almost on par with Russia and uh, only, only North Korea has a significantly worse image. Um, it, I think it's significant to see that also the US uh, is rather perceived rather negatively here. Uh, but we should also not forget these were sort of in the final months of the Trump presidency. So that may have contributed to it. It's hard to tell here from, from the data we have. Next slide, maybe Richard. Uh, thanks. So um, I would also briefly want to talk about the foreign policy orientation and that Richard has mentioned, but are now looking into Germany more specifically. And here, I think Richard has already pointed out, uh, we have first asked, and you see that on the top right corner, uh, sort of what should be foreign policy priorities from German population's uh, perspective. And yes, uh, at, at first spot comes out cooperation with China on global issues like climate change, epidemics, and counterterrorism. Uh, but it's all already very, very uh, shortly followed by human rights advance uh, and democratic reform in China, as well as uh, addressing cybersecurity. Um, there's, there's two comments, personal comments from this, what I find personally uh, really striking. One is that a cooperation uh, on, on global issues, uh, that, that question, I mean, we have asked that question in the middle of a pandemic. So, and, and I think it is, Personally, I would I would uh, assume that uh, the number has been a bit higher because the need to cooperate globally and cooperate with a country like China is probably uh, was probably a bit more apparent. So I think it is quite striking that despite being in the middle of a pandemic, uh, it only uh, outperforms uh, the advance of human rights only slightly. 
Uh, what I also find really striking when you look at, uh, at Germany and, and its relations to, to China, that the promotion of trade and investment ranks relatively low. I mean, yeah, more than 50% say uh, that this should be a foreign policy priority of Germany. But consider the Germany uh, as uh, greatest, largest, uh, most important trade partner is uh, actually China. Um, it's an export nation, so it's it's quite surprising that trade and investment rank relatively low. Uh, finally, the prevention of geopolitical expansion ranks really low, but that should probably give us just an indication that Germans, I would assume, don't think that that's a realistic goal for foreign policy, for German foreign policy to follow. What is also interesting is sort of uh, if you if we look at these other two charts, uh, the role of Germany uh, 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 vice to the to the to to China in comparison to uh, the role of um, the European Union. First of all, we see again foreign policy alignment. Is, uh, the the Germans want to align with the European Union. China ranking lowest among the four uh, powers that we've asked for: EU, US, Russia, and China. But maybe even more interesting, we've also asked, should Germany uh, follow an independent China policy or how should it involve the EU? And we see, well, 30% or almost 30% say they don't know. But if we just look at the rest, uh, I think it is quite interesting that only 20%, less, a bit less than 20% say uh, we want to see an independent China policy, while 30% uh, want Germany to, to take a lead, but within the EU and another 20% uh, 1% here want to follow even the EU state. So uh, within Germany, we see uh, around 50% um, uh, wanting to have an integrated EU uh, approach. Next slide, please. Um, and here, uh, I'll be very brief and then a switch to, to Sweden. I think I've already taken too much time on Germany here. But I want to emphasize again, I mean, you've seen how high human rights rank uh, and um, not only do the Germans uh, see the human rights situation in uh, China in a very negative uh, light, as you can see on the top right corner, but we have also asked whether the Germans believe that uh, prioritizing human rights over e um, uh, in, in our relations with China would come with economic costs. And you see, well, quite a high number. I uh, think uh, it comes at least with some economic cost. You see 45% say some economic cost, another 12% say high economic cost, uh, and only 13% think it doesn't come with any economic cost. And then asking sort of whether uh, Germany should nonetheless prioritize human rights, uh, even if that comes with economic cost, then you see um, uh, well, 36% who neither agree nor disagree, but then if you just compare sort of the, the very left and the very right uh, responses, uh, the, the people who tend to, to disagree and the ones to tend to agree, that more actually are willing to pay uh, an economic price for prioritizing human rights, which is, I think, um, at least for me, a relatively surprising finding that Germans, despite all the trade, despite all the investment uh, cooperation with uh, China, they would like to see a tougher role. And if we look at sort of uh, the role of, of Merkel, who has been prioritizing so much, particularly in the interest of the car industry, I think it is striking that that doesn't really find any support in Germany. And this despite the fact that there's not huge differences of party uh, affiliation, across party affiliation, it is also striking that uh, the conservatives uh, tend to, to be even tougher on China, particularly those that support uh, the uh, Christian uh, Democrats in, in Bavaria and the South. Uh, next slide, please. So moving over to Sweden, I think um, also in a very interesting case, uh, Richard has already pointed out that uh, Sweden is ha holds the most negative view of China. You can see that again on the um, bottom right, that uh, negative perception is even higher than in the German case. Now we are above um, uh, 66%. Um, you can also see that uh, it has dramatically worsened. Almost 60% think uh, it has, or uh, for almost 60% has worsened in the last three years. 
And a similar picture than in Germany, if you look at sort of the comparison to other countries, you can see that Europeans uh, are, other European countries are seen most positively, um, but uh, uh, China is just behind North Korea and Russia. Russia, of course, being a much more, uh, much closer, geographically closer perceived threat for, for the Swedes. So I think it's no wonder that Russia is sort of seen in a more negative light than China, but all other countries are seen more positively than uh, the People's Republic. Um, on the next slide, you, what you can see here is, uh, I've put also trust on here, so you, you can see that. I also wanted to see here, show you here on foreign policy uh, uh, alignment. Again, I mean, uh, very similar here, even democratic reform and defending human rights outperforms cooperation. Uh, but in general, as Richard pointed out, the, um, the findings are very similar. Again, a country that is an export nation uh, ranks relatively uh, low, the promotion of trade and investment, again, here very remarkable, just like in Germany. Um, and also the foreign policy alignment, we have a very similar perspective. What I think is most interesting is the next slide, where we can, uh, uh, look, we, where we had a, a bit of a look into the bilateral relations between Sweden and China. I don't want to get into the details here, but um, it is uh, very uh, striking actually that the bilateral relations between both countries are um, at an historic low. Uh, and what 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 uh, happened is that uh, um, there. To make a long story short, that a Swedish citizen, Gui Min Hai, is being held uh, uh, in China, and um, and uh, he's accused, and I think rightly, is China accused of uh, having not given him a fair trial. He has been abducted from from Thailand and brought to to uh, to mainland China. And in the following, there has been plenty sort of, of confrontation between both sides with uh, uh, Chinese threats towards the country. So, uh, uh, so in, in Sweden has reacted also uh, quite harshly in all ways, the government, but uh, local governments, as well as opposition parties and the general public, uh, the, the media perception uh, has very been very much shaped sort of by these uh, tensions. And uh, so we have asked for a couple of aspects. First of all, maybe the most general on the right bottom corner, we have asked, well, who's actually responsible for, for the situation? And you see an overwhelming majority, the, the two uh, sets in blue, uh, see that China is either, it's mainly China or it's China alone. Um, then there's, uh, um, there's 20% who see Sweden and China share a similar, uh, an equal responsibility, but hardly anyone believes that it's Sweden or it's mainly Sweden. Um, if you look at then two uh, suggestions that have been um, uh, made uh, uh, recently, one is that municipalities and regions of Sweden could end their twinning partnerships. So for example, uh, twinning relationships between two cities. But what is interesting here is that, I mean, there's almost 40% who say, well, we don't really hold an opinion here, but that uh, majority is actually opposed to uh, ending those twinning relations. And also, if you look at uh, the question whether, uh, as some opposition parties have suggested, that Sweden should expel the, the ambassador of uh, China to Sweden, who has taken, who's one of these uh, well-known wolf warriors, probably the most aggressive uh, um, Chinese ambassador in Europe, I would say. Uh, but nonetheless, 47% say no, Sweden should not expel them. Um, and I think that points to the fact that despite China having a very, very uh, negative uh, image in Sweden, that we still think um, that, uh, uh, or that we still sort of see that Swedes want to keep communication channels open and still want to cooperate with China. Something that I think we can see across the board, but Sweden may be a particularly interesting case here since uh, Sweden holds, Swedes hold the most negative view of China. And with that, I think I have been too long. I'm sorry for that. So I hand it over quickly uh, to Una. Thank you, Tim. And um, so Latvia is quite a bit of an outlier in this uh, research, and that's what makes it so interesting. So 
we see that although most uh, countries demonstrate uh, um, a, a worsening uh, perception of China during the during the COVID-19 crisis, in fact, in Latvia, you see, you see that um, the, the opinion has actually improved and 20, 23.8% of respondents uh, say that their opinion of China has improved, whereas almost uh, more than half say that it did didn't affect their perceptions of China at all. And Latvia, out of the EU countries, is the most positive one, with a, a huge chunk of population being either positive or very positive. And then again, uh, one almost a third of the population across all social demographic, uh, social demographics are uh, neutral, whereas the negative perception is quite low. Next slide, please. So what strikes us when we look at this data, we see that actually uh, the, the perception of China is, is better than the perception, for example, of the USA. You see less very negative um, points of view towards China. Um, and you see that the USA is, very is, is a polarizing um, uh, power, but um, of course, again, I want to point out that this goes on, that this data covers all the, econ uh, all the social linguistic um, strata. So we will, we will look, we will dive into it uh, later. But the idea here is that the neutral chunk, uh, um, the neutral chunk of perception of China is very strong. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, what makes uh, Latvian inhabitants so positive uh, and optimistic when it comes to China, regardless of all of the um, recent developments across Europe? We see that when it comes to the, to the issues that everybody in the EU considers uh, challenging, such as China's influence on democracy, such as China's impact on global environment, then Latvian inhabitants as well uh, believe that that is a an, uh, that contributes to their negative perception of China, right? You see the uh, the, the data here in the um, lower right corner. Same goes for Chinese military power. Oh, quite quite a negative um, showing. Although we have to say that comparing to other countries, uh, my co-nationals are more toward the center of the spectrum rather than uh, towards the end of the spectrum. Belt and Road is perceived with neutrality and probably it's, um, it's, it's always a question whether the respondents even know uh, and understand what is Belt and Road, but here we see that the positive, with a slight tilt towards positivity, which is interesting in itself. But the answer to the positivity lies in the fact that the Latvians still believe that the trade with China can be a good thing for our economy and that we can still see some Chinese investment coming here. And that is what our research has shown, which is um, which um, contributes to this um, perception, even in the COVID era. Thank you. Next slide, please. When it comes to trust, then again, Latvians overwhelmingly seem to trust China and again, you see the United States uh, are, are a polarizing actor here. But the good thing and the very interesting, in my opinion, conclusion is that there is no zero sum between trusts towards China uh, or Russia in, among some, uh, some groups of the population and trust towards the EU. What does that mean? That means that the the EU has been doing a remarkably good job at keeping this diverse demographic positive and trustful of the EU. Actually, the trust towards the EU, this does not uh, come out of this data, but it comes from other surveys, has improved and has grown uh, in comparison to 2004 when we joined. So you see that the European Union is a very positive actor here. Um, and that is, that is good news. Now, whether the Latvians are able to differentiate between the economic gains, this, this pragmatic approach, and the values. Yes, evidently so. Uh, when it comes to the human rights situation, China 
score scores low. And people do agree that this situation is very bad, bad or somewhat bad. With again, a big chunk of people still saying that it's neither and that it's not really their problem, but still. So you see that when it comes to values, people still have a voice here. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to the Latvian society, one of the factors that we need to keep in mind is the fact that this is very multi-ethnic society uh, and it is being, um, it, it is comprised of two major linguistic groups and I'm not saying ethnic groups because these linguistic groups um, for, are formed of, of different ethnicities. One of them would be the Latvian speakers and the other group, significant group, which is uh, below 40%, about 30, 35 to 40% um, is the Russian speakers. And you see that the feeling towards China is determined by the language speaking is spoken at home. So you see the Latvian speakers are being strongly um, more distrustful towards um, uh, to, if, towards China and feelings and, and feel and harboring more negative feelings towards China than the Russian speakers. However, there is still a big chunk of Latvian speakers that find China neutral, positive, or even some of them very positive. And again, having cross-referenced this with the, uh, with the voting patterns, we see that um, again, the voting patterns don't account, the ideology doesn't really account for these feelings so much as, again, language. So you would see the traditional Latvian speaking parties across all, all of the spectrum. You would see the, um, the, the liber ranging from liber liberals to uh, conservative forces. You see that their voters still do not hold very positive views of China. Whereas the traditional Russian parties, again, again, throughout the spectrum, you see that there's much more um, a kind of uh, hope there or, 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 or a better uh, approach, if you will. Um, and we also see that uh, the language spoken at home and how it influences the feeling towards China, has a, how, how it has changed during COVID times, we see that the differences here are not uh, that big, so we see that the, the linguistic factor here does not account for it. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Go back, please. This is. The, I just want to finish with um with with the, with some uh, conclusions. So we see that first of all, uh, the mo the least controversial aspect of cooperation with China across all communities is economy. So the Latvian speakers, the Russian speakers, you name it, they all kind of still believe that China could be uh, a magic, uh, magic solution uh, when it comes to diversification of our economy. And um, they also, Latvian respondents tend to choose positive agenda points in cooperation with China. They speak of economy, they speak of climate change, epidemic control and counterterrorism, and they deprioritize the critical ones, right? Cybersecurity, intellectual property rights, human rights, so there's that again signals optimism. Uh, again, the EU is a uniting factor and that is a good thing across all linguistic uh, communities. But I want to finish by saying that I put big emphasis on the linguistic factor, but that does not in all honesty reveal the whole picture. Because even among the voters of the parties that appeal to the Latvian speakers, the numbers of positive approaches towards China are somewhere between 21 to 43%. It's a huge chunk. And that means that the Latvian speakers also have this economic rationale. They're not politically sympathetic towards China, make no mistake, right? They're not, um, they're, they're, their approach towards communism also in this cross-referenced shows that. But they still have this idea that it's best to go with the devil you don't know. The devil that we know is the Russian Federation, whereas the devil we don't know is China. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Una. Uh, I will now take over for the uh, final part. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, okay, great. 
so I will uh, first of all present the outlier uh, that we saw in uh, Richard's presentation. Uh, it's obvious that Serbia stands out uh, quite a lot among all the countries that we've surveyed. And if we look at the overall sentiment, we can see that the overall view of China and the upper right corner is very positive and positive with uh, only around 20% having a negative view of China. And I won't go into the differences within the country, but it seems that now we've started diving a bit deeper into the results that this is quite consistent across different political orientations, uh, different media outlets that people follow. So even within a relatively divided society such as Serbia, the view of China seems to be quite consistent. And also a bit surprisingly, the view of China has improved uh, in the past three years. This is based on the self uh, perception of the participants. If we look at the perceptions of other countries, we have North Korea and the United States at the bottom and the UK. And then on the top, we have Russia. Interestingly, Japan surpasses China. Uh, but then, yeah, it's definitely in the top three countries. So these are definitely the countries uh, that are seen most positive in uh, Serbia. And it's obvious that uh, it has been looking more eastwards when it comes to the countries that they prefer to cooperate with. And if we look at the next slide, uh, we can look a bit more in detail into uh, different foreign policy goals and interests in cooperation. Uh, in the lower left corner, we can see the same uh, sort of scales that uh, Una also showed for Latvia. We saw, see that trade with China is seen as quite positive and Chinese investments as well. Uh, one thing that I emphasize in the Serbian report, which I invite you to read in full if you're interested in this topic, is that uh, China is seen as very powerful, both in terms of its economy, but also interestingly, its military. And for a region that has had a lot of uh, unrest in the past decades, this uh, might be a very important factor. And the Belt and Road Initiative, of course, which is very active in terms of its projects in the Western Balkans and in Serbia is seen as quite positive. If we move to the right part of the screen, uh, we can see also that China and Russia are seen as very important uh, for uh, Serbia's economic development, uh, which is probably in line with the investment projects that have been going on. But the EU is also seen as quite important, whereas the United States are seen as less important. And then when it comes to foreign policy, this is also reflected. So the above view of importance for economy is reflected in the uh, desired foreign policy orientation. So Serbs would prefer that uh, Serbia aligns their foreign policy with Russia and China, and then only then with the European Union and the least with the United States. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, what I wanted to also show here is a comparison of Serbian results in relation to the policy brief that we've mentioned, which you can find on Churn's website. So the policy brief that the four of us drafted uh, deals only with the Europe EU countries. So we wanted to focus on the European Union. Uh, but I also added the Serbian data here. Uh, if we look at the left part of the screen, we can see the first figure from the policy brief with Serbia added. Uh, it's clear it's the same picture that you saw already perhaps in uh, Richard's uh, figures. So Serbia has a lot more trust and a uh, much more positive view uh, of China than even the largest EU outlier, which is Latvia. Uh, and then if we look at the right hand side, it is the perception, the general perception. So on the top, we have the aggregated EU view. And then uh, on the lower uh, side, it, it's, it's very glaring, the differences between Serbia and uh, other EU countries. So China is seen as much more positive. But then if we go to the next slide, uh, and we take a look a bit more at the different foreign policy priorities, uh, we can see something that I find a bit encouraging in terms of uh, Serbia's European path or EU path. Um, it's that if we look at the top three and the bottom three, if we divide them in, in the same way, so two of the three are always the same. Uh, of course, that uh, our results were likely uh, influenced by the fact that the survey was done during the COVID-19 pandemic, but at the same time, the same way the pandemic doesn't seem to be going away quickly, these uh, orientations might not change as quickly either. Uh, this situation might have raised the awareness among people that there is a need to cooperate on global issues. So cooperation on global issues, the left is Serbia, right, it's European countries, it's uh, the top priority, but then at the same time, promotion of trade and investment, and this is probably in line with uh, 
uh, the importance of China for Serbia's economic development. And similarly to EU countries preventing Chinese geo geopolitical expansion, be it for, uh, as Tim uh, posited, maybe uh, the idea that there's nothing we can do about it, or maybe just not an interest for any kind of global rates, that is definitely the uh, lowest uh, priority. And then if we go to the final slide, and address the uh, elephant in the room or the elephant in the Zoom <laughs> where we are, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's a good way perhaps to round uh, up the presentation and to circle back to all of the countries. So now not looking just at Serbia, but looking at all the countries, uh, we can see uh, that uh, if we look at figure 25 on the left hand side of the, of the screen, uh, we can see in numbers uh, something that has been termed at the beginning of the pandemic as China's mask diplomacy. And now we can maybe call it the vaccine diplomacy with Serbia sort of being at par, at par with the UK, but leading the way in Europe with vaccinations with the Chinese vaccine. Uh, we can see the perception that uh, China helped uh, Serbia a lot. So those are the red lines. And then also following Italy and Hungary, who uh, were also uh, perhaps a bit critical of the way the EU helped them during the pandemic. Now, this is, of course, the perception. It would be interesting to look at the exact figures and whether this is really in line with uh, the uh, amount of aid that was given. Uh, but that is for future research. And then the final figure uh, that I wanted to show you is on the right hand side of the screen, which is the view on whether China's global position uh, changed. So the yellow bars are whether China's reputation improved and then the red whether it gained economically. And we can see that uh, Hungary, uh, Spain, Poland, they do have the idea that China has gained uh, uh, economically. But then other than Serbia, in most countries, the number of people who think China's reputation has improved is uh, very low, which is in line with some uh, other studies that are looking at whether uh, China is being blamed in a way for the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll now move to the final slide. And uh, we will thank you for your attention. And here are our contacts in case you want to get in touch with us. I do invite you, if you're interested, to read the work and get in touch with us, because this is uh, perhaps a first step in a very uh, long-term project where we do intend to repeat these surveys and to work further on these results. And we will have another event um, that is related to this project later on uh, in Churn's online series. So now I'd like to invite Alexander to please stop the recording. So goodbye to our internet audience. Okay.